My name is Marcy Stowell, the Assistant Director of Executive Development at MSU. Today, we're presenting one aspect of managing in this remote environment that most of us are in now. First, Dr. Ken Levine will share his insights with you, and second, I will share your questions with him. So as we begin, please remember that we would like your questions. Please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to submit your questions throughout the presentation. I will share as many of those as time allows with Dr. Levine. After we conclude today, we'll provide you a link to a recording of the webinar, which will be, pro be posted on our YouTube channel. So now I would like to introduce you to Dr. David Freyer, the Assistant Dean of Outreach and Engagement for Broke College. Dr. Freyer, thank you for being here today and thank you for supporting this summer series. Thank you so much, Marcy, and really appreciate all your work uh, assembling the speakers and doing just such a great job uh, putting this together for us. Um, welcome, everyone. On behalf of uh, Dean Gupta and the Broad College Business, I want to welcome you to the session today. Uh, if this is your first session, welcome. We're excited to have you. If you're a, a repeat customer coming back, uh, if this is the third in the series, uh, welcome back. We're, we're really excited to see you. I'm very, very pleased to have uh, Ken Levine uh, with us today. Uh, Ken is uh, just a, a fantastic speaker, uh, a real expert in organizational communication uh, from our College of Communication Arts and Sciences here at Michigan State University. I think you're really going to enjoy his remarks. And, and we've actually been living uh, much of what uh, Ken's going to be talking about today is, as we work our way through uh, the global pandemic. Uh, Ken's been instrumental in some of our programs that we're actually offering for units inside Michigan State University, our, our IT services group, our controller office um, as they all pivot and, and attempt to do their jobs remotely. Um, and so we're pretty excited that uh, he's able to share with us today some insights on, uh, you know, how do we build openness and trust in a remote working environment? Uh, these are huge challenges for all of us. And, and again, we're really excited, Ken, uh, that you're here today. And, and so rather than taking more of your time, let me turn it right over to you uh, to share your thoughts with the group. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here. And thank you for the very nice introduction. What's really interesting is that six, eight months ago, the idea of a remote workplace was really alien to all of us. So um, we're, we're going through this quickly and uh, I'll just begin my, my presentation. So quickly, I'm going to introduce the topic. I have some definitions, uh, talk a little bit about in-person versus remote and I have a, a real world example at the end. So I was part of a study just a year ago on voluntary turnover. And it was done here in mid-Michigan. We had over 800 participants, mostly in manufacturing, but in a variety of different fields. And we found that openness and trust from managers and leaders was the most cited reason for an employee to voluntarily leave a company. That was not what we anticipated. We were expecting pay to be the, the biggest reason that people would leave, but it was a distant second and benefits and work group dynamics were third and, and much further on down the list. So we know from research that openness and trust um, from managers and leaders is really, a, a really an important part of the organizational life and that the lack of that really brings forward, or really brings people to think about looking for a new job. So yes, as I said, this is a, a year ago, so it's a pre-COVID world. And so we're curious if these findings still apply, um, but I believe that they do. Um, the employees may not find a new job, but they won't stop them from looking. And we did find out that there were, a lot of this is age related. So generation X, generation Y, you may call them Generation Z. I like the name iGens, but they valued relationships more than they value some of the other more established parts of the organizational life. So we do believe that this idea of openness and trust being an important part of keeping your good employees is going to be something that remains. Um, there's also 30 years of research suggesting that some employees believe that information is being withheld. No matter what you do, some people will always say that they don't know what's going on. But we do know that if managers and leaders exhibit openness and trust, it reduces this belief that information is being withheld. 
So that's another important aspect of openness and trust. But as I said, we need some definitions. We need to know what these things mean. So openness, as you can see just from this word map, uh, has a lot of different meanings. But I found in, in our research that there are really two dimensions of openness. There's the idea of task openness and relational openness. So I'll start with task. Um, open communication and open dialogue create opportunities for individuals to ask questions and to correct their mistakes. And so if you feel comfortable with your manager or your leader, and you can go to that person and say, listen, I don't get it, or I don't understand, or you didn't like what I did, what did I do wrong? That's going to create a relationship of trust and openness where you get the job done correctly, which is, of course, what most people want. Um, and it allows for employee feedback um, so that I can ask questions, I can feel comfortable asking questions. So if I get an assignment and I don't understand it, I need to be able to ask questions because I don't want to do it incorrectly. And certainly my boss doesn't want me to go through the process of doing a, um, an assignment incorrectly. So I always think of the example of undercover boss um, because we, we do know that people at lower levels of organizations know a lot about how to do their job. So if we can allow for employee feedback, we know that it can be helpful and productive. It can give us some new ideas on how to undertake some, um, some of the processes and some of our, um, and to help um, improve our outcomes. And when managers and leaders listen, it also creates opportunities for growth by hearing these new ideas. Just because you've come up through the ranks or that you're in, in a management position doesn't mean that you can't be open to new ideas um, and that you shouldn't be open to new ideas. So that's part of the reason you want to have this type of relationship with your employees. You want to give, have a lot of give and take in terms of communication. Other things, um, we need the belief again that managers and leaders are providing information that's necessary and needed. Um, most employees would rather have negative in information than no information at all. I'd rather know that I was doing something incorrectly than just be out there in the dark. Um, we have this idea, it's called NETMA. We always want to avoid NETMA, which is no one ever tells me anything. And I don't know if any of you have been in an organization where you're sort of floundering or you're just out there by yourself, no one tells you anything. It's very frustrating. And as someone who studies organizational communication, we know just how important it is that there be a feedback loop that people know what's going on and that you don't feel like you are, in fact, netma. No one ever tells me anything. The other aspect of openness is relational. Um, and that allows all members of the organization to get to know one another. Uh, it's really important to remember that it really is all about relationships. We see these people, or at least we used to see these people every day in person. Now we see them oftentimes via Zoom, but it's still someone with whom you have a relationship. It's important to be able to get to know them. And so being able to be open uh, and discuss issues that are going on at work um, with someone in a more informal, uh, in a more informal man manner creates really solid relationships. And it permits employees to express how they're feeling. It may not be um, that people want to talk about it, but some are likely to express that they're feeling frustrated. Or right now we know that people are feeling lonely or that they're feeling disconnected. And we need to let people say that, especially now in this environment, we need to be able to let people express the way they're feeling. So that's part of, again, relational openness. And that's different from the idea of trust. Uh, trust is a bound that people uh, will permit ideas to, free, to flow freely. So if you see in this little chart, uh, we have the idea of openness, uh, diversity of ideas, and transparency. And we know that these three aspects of trust all play together, and they're all important to bring together in terms of coming up with new ideas, whether they be process ideas or product ideas, 
um, or work-related task ideas. Um, we also know that trust is all about credibility. You have to trust that the person who is giving you information or to whom you are giving information is credible, that they're believable, that they're experts in their field. If the person delivering the information is not credible, employees are gonna dismiss the information. And that's obviously the last thing that you want. So the person in a management or a leadership position needs to be credible. We'll talk a little bit more about that a little later on in the, in the presentation. But believability and credibility are utmost important when it comes to trust. So trust is the foundation from which relationships can or will grow. Again, think of your, your own uh, boss in your organization. Um, do you trust them? And if you do, how does that change the way you interact with them versus, let's say, if you don't trust them? Even in a friendship situation or a social situation, are there people uh, with whom you have a non-trusting relationship? What do you say to them? Or more importantly, what don't you say to them? And how would that impact how work gets done in the organization? Um, and it's also a belief of management and coworkers that employees are capable enough to do their jobs well. So the trust coming from the other direction. If management trusts employees, then the employees feel as though they can go and do their work without having someone look over their shoulder or make them feel bad. So trust is a two-way street. It's both trusting those in the organization who may have a position higher than yours and also trusting the people who may have a position lower than yours, but who are doing the work. Um, and again, it has a lot to do with the belief of employees that they have the information needed uh, so that they can achieve success. And if I trust that I have all the information and that I've been given what I need to succeed, I'm likely to work harder than if I, have than if I feel I don't have that type of information and that I may fail due to a lack of really knowing what I have to do. So that's an, another huge aspect of trust. So how do I foster trust and openness? Well, in the in-person workplace, we used to talk about management by walking around. That's simply what it says. The manager goes from office to office or cubicle to cubicle and has a relationship and fosters it on a daily basis or a weekly basis. We have the open door policy. Um, can I just stick my head in your office and ask you a question? Do I need to make an appointment? How open and free was it to communicate with you um, when we were in the office together in person? Um, and impromptu meetings, they can happen in the hallway, they can happen um, getting coffee, it was mentioned before. Um, there are all sorts of times when impromptu meetings would just happen and they would answer questions they would again foster relationships, which would then foster openness. But we know in the remote workplace, none of this is happening. You know, my, my boss is not gonna stick his or her head into my office. Having an open door policy doesn't exist. And there are no impromptu meetings. I have to sign on to Zoom. I have to create some sort of, um, it's a more formal process rather than this informal process. So we're doing unique things in the remote workplace. And I've done a little research, finding out what people are doing. A lot of organizations now have a daily check-in Zoom meeting. It might be at nine o'clock. Um, just let everyone come in, talk about what they're doing, talk about the goals for the day. But it's, again, it's a way to get everybody to see everybody, a way for people to greet and to know who's in the office or at least in the workplace and what to do, what to do next. Um, it's important for consistency. These meetings do not need to be very long. If there's nothing to discuss, there's nothing to discuss, and that's fine. Um, many organizations are now permitting people to turn off their cameras. And while well, I'm not going to do that right now, there's a really good reason for allowing people to turn off their cameras for these check-in meetings. And one has to do with the uniqueness of the Zoom technology or all video conferencing technology is I'm 
when I'm presenting or if I'm in an in-person meeting, I don't see myself. I'm not looking at myself in a little window, but in Zoom or other platforms, I'm seeing myself. And for many people, it's awkward or it's um, off-putting because they're watching themselves communicate rather than spending a lot of time listening to what's going on. It also allows people to be a little bit more casual in their clothing. I'm not gonna talk about that very much, but if you're not gonna be on camera, um, you, can, um, you can dress a little bit differently. So that's one thing that many organizations are doing. Uh, other organizations are scheduling one-to-one -one meetings or one-to-one -one calls between people in the office place just to keep them connected. So just like in networking where a lot of people have a one-to-one -one with somebody scheduled over the course of time, um, isn't a bad idea to schedule one-to-ones, 15-minute calls, just to get everybody catch up, to see where they're going, again, to see if there are any questions. It's a set time each week, like I said. Um, and then you can call or text when information is needed quickly. I know that a number of uh, managers have given out their cell phone numbers so you can check. Uh, you can text if there's a question. Uh, one thing that does come back is that we can't, we can't abuse this. Don't be the employee who called Wolf. You don't need to text for every question. Um, wait until you have a number of questions. Don't be the person who texts all day because you can imagine being on the other side of that, receiving text after text after text, just like receiving email after email after email. You're not getting your work done because you're spending all of your time dealing with these questions. So it's important for workers to think about, is this a really important question or can it wait and can I combine my questions into something, into a sort of one big email or, or text at the end of the day. So these are some of the strategies for the remote workplace. Um, but one thing that, again, going back to trust and openness and how this all plays together, how were you informed that your office was going to close? Um, just think back to that day in February or March when you found out that you weren't going to work anymore, that you were going to be working from home. How was that information disseminated? And while I hope this never happens again, how would you like to see that information disseminated should this ever happen again? What can we learn about this? Um, and in terms of trust and openness, if to, this is still a time of great uncertainty, but certainly in February or March, it's a time of great uncertainty for everyone. And so there was a lot of anxiety when we were giving the message that we were closing and a lot of anxiety in receiving it. Um, were you given the opportunity to ask questions? Again, if you're used to a very open relationship, you're used to being asked the ability to ask questions, but it may have been that in the rush to close and the rush just to get everything working, there was no opportunity to ask questions. So if you were able to ask questions, were they answered? And not that anybody was at fault for this because we didn't have any answers, but were you given any incorrect information? And again, going forward, let's think about how we felt when we learned a week or two weeks or three weeks later that that piece of information we learned upon learning the office was closing was in fact wrong. And how did that make you feel? How did that impact your openness and trust with your manager? So takeaway, one of the takeaways is going forward, it's okay to say you don't know the answer. And there have been many surveys that have discussed, is it okay for a manager or leader to say, I don't know? And all of them come back with a resounding yes. It's okay to say you don't know. Um, and in this case, we really didn't know. We had no idea, none of us, I'm think, I had ever lived through anything like this before. So we didn't know, was, were we gonna close for a month? Were we going to close for two months? Well, it's July and we're still closed. Nothing we ever said. So if you don't know, say you don't know. Um, an honest answer builds credibility and builds trust. And a guess does exactly the opposite. So I think maybe we're just gonna close for a couple of weeks, a month or two later, you've lost credibility. 
versus just saying, I have no idea. And saying I have no idea, like I said, is fine. A guess or a wrong answer diminishes credibility and diminishes trust. So again, think back to that day in February or March. Uh, what was going through your mind? How would you do this differently if we ever have to do anything like this again? Or if even there's a time of uncertainty, not closing the office for a pandemic, but other things that are happening, maybe it's time to say, I don't know, when in fact, you don't know. So I'm gonna use a real world example. And this came from an advice column. You might think advice columns are sort of funny places to look for examples, but I like to read advice columns, I always have, because they really give you a snapshot of what's going on in the world around you, what's bothering people, what's happening right now. So this was, um, this came from a May edition of an advice column. Um, I am married with a new baby and I work at a small company. My husband and I haven't had childcare since February due to the virus. We have no free time. We're either working, sleeping, or caring for our child. I had a big deadline at work last week. After I met it, I asked my boss for a few days off. He said it was a good idea, but now I'm sensing some coldness towards me. Was I selfish to ask for time off um, when everyone needs a break? And it was just signed M. So I have no idea if M is a male or a female, um, but we'll just go with calling this person M. But going back, I'm just gonna diagnose this problem because I see three major issues. Maybe you see more. The first is the no child care since February issue. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but that's certainly a work-life balance issue and a working from home, an unexpected working from home issue. Um, big, big deadline at work, which I met, and I asked my boss for a few days off. I see these as the three major questions that M asks in that advice uh, request. Um, the boss said it was a good idea, but now I'm sensing coldness towards me. So that's the subset. So let's start with the no child care since February. And as I said, this is a work-life balance issue in ways, again, we never saw this coming. Uh, we always have had work-life balance um, issues, um, but certainly the idea that I'd be working from home, perhaps a spouse is also working from another part of a home, and if I have school-aged children, they're not in school. That's never happened quite that way before. So just gonna go over what uh, classified as four types of work-life conflict. Uh, the first type of work-life conflict to talk about is time-based, um, and that's competition from multiple demands. Um, usually this used to be working overtime, uh, using work as an escape, um, from relational issues, but time-based now has also come to mean what happens when, you know, I'm working, perhaps a spouse is working, uh, again, and, and the baby needs something. There's an energy-based conflict that has to do with the amount of physical vigor devoted to work. Um, so in the old days, you used to perhaps arrive home too tired to play with the children. Now you leave your office, but you can also be emotionally exhausted in ways that are different from the physical exhaustion that used to be part of the energy-based idea. So changing definitions a little bit, but simply emotional exhaustion, spending seven hours on Zoom. How does that play out? We have this idea of strain-based work-life conflict, role stressors in one domain spill over into another, um, crankiness at home attributed to work-life episodes, well, we're not leaving home now. So if there's a problem at home, it stays with us all day. Uh, we don't have even the ability to leave. Maybe we can go for a walk at lunchtime, but we're, we're at home. And so this strain-based, these role stressors in our different positions, let's say whether your spouse and parent and worker are all happening in the same physical space. And lastly, we have this behavioral um, idea of work-life conflict where manner or style in one domain is in conflict with the other. So are you the boss at work? 
Are you the boss at home? Are you a parent at home? Are you working or, or are you pretending or, or acting like a parent at work? Um, and these behavior-based work-life conflict issues have really come back to hurt a lot of people, both in the work relationship, because no one wants to be treated like a child, and in the home where nobody wants to be treated like an employee. So we have these four types of work-life conflict, um, and that goes back to that question from M saying that they've had no childcare since February. So what do they do? They're probably experiencing all four of these types of work-life conflict. And it's important that management understand this because it's quite possible that management is also um, dealing with these same four types of work-life conflict. Most all of us are dealing with something to do with working uh, from home and the, the additional distractions as well as issues that are brought up uh, with those, those types of work-life conflict. So that's the first one, uh, the idea of um, not having childcare since February. The second theme that I saw in M's problem was the big deadline at work, which I met. So we can take away that M is a good employee. M had a deadline and met the deadline. Um, it should have been great, move on. Because we know that that would have been acknowledged very differently in person than perhaps it's being acknowledged now. Something as simple as a job well done, the figurative you know, pat on the back, the idea of somebody saying, you know, really happy you did this. Uh, maybe the boss brings in snacks after a big deadline. I've actually worked for companies where when we finish something, there would be a little party, 15 minutes. Um, I'm a big advocate for feeding workers. Um, but you can never go wrong. Um, after a big deadline, maybe the next hour or two, you'd sit back and relax with the people with whom you've been working, unwind, talk about what went right, what went wrong, what were some of the problems, and just sort of you know, let it flow. And you, perhaps if you had a long commute, you'd de-stress on the ride home. Again, thinking about everything you'd accomplished, and you'd sort of be happy that I finished this, this is really good. Um, and so you'd have positive feelings about meeting the deadline and now excitement about what was gonna happen next. But how do we do this remotely? Because we can't do any of those things I just mentioned. We can say job well done, but that means a Zoom call. That wasn't just somebody walking by or when I handed it in um, or a quick email back. It still can be a quick email back. But I'm calling this the virtual donut. What can we do virtually that's the same as bringing in snacks? And I'm not sure I have really good ideas, but I do know that it is important to give somebody some acknowledgement, give them the virtual donut. Uh, thank you for what you've done. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you for meeting the deadline. I know you have a lot going on, uh, work-life balance issues. So make the employee feel special and appreciated. Um, and it's, again, not just another thank you email. Do something that's exciting. Um, and again, all employees deal with things differently, but perhaps during that morning check-in meeting, you can say, M finished this deadline yesterday, really proud of what M did, and thank you very much. Just again, acknowledge it so that it's not lost in the, in the ether somewhere that I finished my deadline and I did what I needed to do. Um, and the last of the three things that I see from this example is I asked for a few days off, but now I'm sensing some coldness towards me. Um, well, first of all, we probably wouldn't have done this in the in-person workplace because if you finished your deadline, you wouldn't have all the exhaustion of work-life balance. You wouldn't have some of the other issues going on. But it's not surprising that M feels exhausted right now. Um, but the manager also has to remember that in terms of openness and trust, that it's important to acknowledge that it's not the same work day. There's so much more going on. And yes, maybe this person really does need a day off or two. Um, if you're feeling overwhelmed with someone you trust, 
you should be able to have this discussion without sensing any coldness. Um, so again, if you are open and trusting with your superior and say, listen, you know, I really worked hard on this, but with everything else going on, I just need a day off. And so if you're, if you have the open and trusting relationship, then this should, shouldn't have been a problem. But if you're overwhelmed and you don't have the open and trusting relationship, you can imagine that A, your manager won't know how you're, that you're feeling this, and you won't feel comfortable saying it. There'll be some burnout. There'll be a lot of dissatisfaction because no one took into account the uniqueness of your current situation. Um, and your manager may think that the request for time off is unusual or to come out of the blue because you've never done that before. Again, they may not be thinking about you and your position or M and M's position of just being a little bit exhausted. Um, the columnist, the advice columnist said, be kinder to yourself. But what I really liked what the advice columnist said, um, it's work, it's not personal. You're entitled to your vacation. He says at the end, um, go not just go and relax. But it, it is work, it's not personal. Um, and so if there was coldness, it probably wasn't intentional. Again, your manager may be going through the same work-life balance issues you are. So if you have an open and trusting relationship, um, one of the things you may need to know is if your boss is primarily task-oriented, your boss may just never think that you're going to need this time. Um, if they don't think about you in terms of a relational um, a relationship, rather than you're just someone to do a job. And you know that about your boss, so try to think about that. Um, and again, try to think that the boss may be having remote work-life balance issues also. And so the coldness you're, feel, you're feeling is really just their uh, dealing with their own moment their own understanding of what's happening right now. And bosses have bad days, just like the rest of us. Any of those four work-life balance issues could be impacting your boss, just like it impacts you. So the burden is not only on the boss to create an open en environment and relationship, it's on the employees too. So remember that everybody is going through this together um, and give your boss a little bit of slack, just like we give the employees perhaps a little bit of slack. So I have three takeaways to the, this is work, it's not personal. Um, when you interact with someone at work, try to remain optimistic, definitely remain professional. Try to remain, again, as, as, um, as task oriented, but also um, as, um, like I said, as positive, as trusting and open as possible. Uh, managers need to appreciate that their employees are doing their best possible work under these very unique conditions, and workers need to understand that they're not, there may not be answers to their questions. So in terms of trust and openness, I think these are the three major takeaways. You know, keep interacting in an optimistic, positive way. Um, remember to treat your employees um, with the understanding that there's a unique situation going on, and don't just assume that, um, that there's an answer to my question. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, you can contact me at my email address, levineke at msu.edu. I also have a website called orptipsandtalks.com. And however you choose to do it, please enjoy your virtual donuts. Thank you, Ken. I will be looking for that virtual donut. I need a little reward at the end of the day. So that's a great one that you shared with everyone. Um, we have had some questions coming in while you're speaking, and I want to encourage you, if you're listening, that if you have a question, you are welcome to submit that. We will get through several because we have 25 minutes yet to go, so we welcome your questions. The first one I have for you is about company. So we all understand that companies can't or aren't 100% transparent on all issues, how do you suggest we deal with the employee's perception when they feel that information is being withheld? Well, that's a great question. And that's, that's been a problem for, for decades. Um, the one thing that we suggest is that if you allow people to ask questions, 
about the information they think they don't know, the, the information they, they believe is being withheld. Be open enough to allow those questions to be asked. And then you can follow up with, you know, we've said this before, but here, let's go over this again. This is the policy, this is the requirements, excuse me, this is what we're doing. Um, and then just ask, is this any different from any of the information that we've talked about before? Or how could this information, how can I make sure that you receive this information that you don't feel you're getting? So certainly give the information if you can, and then ask for feedback as to why there is this continued disbelief or unbelief that I'm being kept in the dark. Um, and try to find out what the, what the reason for that belief is. And if you can figure out, if you hear enough employees say, well, this particular person never talks to me. So I believe that there's stuff that I don't know. Well, now you've got a problem. I mean, now you've got a, a real solid indication that the problem comes from X employee. And you can go talk to X employee and get them to understand how important openness and trust is. Yeah, shine a little light. I think most people understand that there's some things they're not privy to in right. the moment, but they can learn how they're impacted by it when the time is right. And there, and just like you said, there is some information that bosses are likely not going to share with you for legitimate purposes, legitimate reasons. We're certainly not going to talk about any other employee's um, uh, assessment. That's information that's confidential. So there is information that's not shared. But if, if I feel that you're not sharing something that's keeping me from success, that's the type of information we need to clamp down on and make sure is in fact shared. Sure. So a little context behind this question and then we're gonna get into some of the debate or questions that have been going on about having camera on or off during <laughs> I knew that would I knew that would bring up some questions. Yeah, it's been what we talk about this spring, right? Um, but before we do that, uh, I wanted to give you a little context. We've been having conversations of late asking, how do I discern how my team is doing? When I see them, when I see them through Zoom or Teams or web conferencing, I ask the question, but I always get responses like, I'm fine. And it's hard to know how a person's actually doing and how to support them. So do you have suggestions for us to help discern an employee's attitude right now with our current limited communication tools? Um, well, that was one of the reasons I mentioned the one-on-ones. It's because I ask in a meeting, everyone's going to say they're fine. But if I have a good relationship and we have a 15-minute meeting every you know, Wednesday at one, then maybe I can express a little bit more of things that are good and things that are bad. Um, there's also the um, importance of having um, like drop-in sessions. So give, you know, send out a Zoom invite. You can come if you want, you don't have to. Um, that's another way. And, you know, again, keeping everything safe and socially distant, um, there may be a way if you, someone really needs to talk to you, they can, you can come somewhere near the office take a socially distant walk um, and really let out some steam as well as get some good exercise. But it's, there may be some things that are really important that no one feels comfortable saying via this type of environment or this type of platform. And be open to allowing someone to sit across the parking lot, you know, on their car and, and just expressing some, um, some concerns. And just leave that, I would suggest that as a, as a possibility. Okay, thank you. And in a, a slightly bigger picture, when you have your team on Zoom, you mentioned a few ways to um, reward them. What are some ways that you could be encouraging to your team in Zoom other than the verbal affirmation or the donut, which we're all happy to have now? <laughs> Yes, uh, and I'm, I, I don't own stock in Dunkin' Donuts, but um, <laughs> the, um, one of the things that, I, that I've talked about in my classes and in my seminars is that bosses, if good bosses know their employees well, and they know that there are some employees 
who really need a lot of affirmation, need a lot of positive feedback. And there are other employees that don't. In fact, they don't like to be publicly recognized. They just want to do their job. So this is the time when those good managers need to take that piece of information about each individual employee. And for those who need a little bit more encouragement, you're going to have to go out of your way. And maybe it is sending a little care package of some type, sending a, um, you know, a food delivery or something. Um, and for the people who don't need affirmation, again, you want to be fair, but maybe there is a day when you give out um, certificates to, uh, to local uh, food restu restaurants or takeout or the grocery store. Um, allow, just give everybody something um, that they feel is some sort of affirmation that they're doing what they're supposed to do. But it, in terms of verbal or, or email, again, it's really important for managers to take the information that they know about their employees and to really, this is a time to use that information. If somebody needs to be, needs to receive a lot of affirmation, give it to them. Send them emails, doing a great job, um, or texts. And if you have other employees that want to be left alone, then leave them alone. Do, this is a time to really let employees be themselves. So let's go there. I'm going to ask you about the video on or off. Um, we hear that companies have spent a lot of time encouraging video on to increase openness. There were several questions about um, the benefits of having the video on. When do you think it's acceptable to have video off? And how would you suggest transitioning so that employees still are turning it on when managers really need them to have it on? I know people have often said, well, if I turn my video off, everyone's going to multitask. I don't know how many people are watching, but my guess is that 90% of them also check their email at some point during this presentation um, or did something else. And we know it's happening. It happens in classes, it happens in meeting, every meeting I'm a part of. Um, so trust your employees that they'll pay attention while they're doing other things. And maybe it's not a camera off all the time, but just like there's casual Friday, maybe it's camera off Friday. Um, so make it almost a, re a reward for dealing with camera on Monday through Thursday, but give, you know, it, it's a way to shake up things, but uh, I've talked to a few people whose companies have gone to camera off and they said that they're much happier um, and they feel freer to, in, to uh, interact. And part of it is because they're not watching themselves. Um, and so the openness and trust comes back because it's more like a real world telephone call. It's not a Zoom meeting anymore. It's a phone call where I'm not... I don't see myself and the receiver, and I don't see the receiver either. So I, I would phase it in, like I'd say I'd have a no video on Friday, see how it goes, see if people still participate. If it works, great, incorporate it. If it doesn't work, you know, you try. Yeah, that's great advice. That's purposeful um, sharing of your video, you know, and it acknowledges that there's some times where it is appropriate or a reward to be able to not have your video on. So I don't know if we actually got through the debate. I'm certain that others are still gonna be challenged with that, um, but it is definitely something great to think about um, as we continue to work in this type of a world. We'll need to adapt a little. So I have two issues to ask you about now. Okay. Um, one of them is a question asking, I ask my employees if they have questions regularly and usually it's quiet. But later I hear that they feel they are not receiving information. This occurs in one-on-ones and in team meetings. What do you recommend for addressing that? Um, well, it's not a huge surprise that it's happening in team meetings because oftentimes if I have a question, it's because I don't understand something and I don't want to admit that to the group. So it shouldn't come as a really big surprise that people aren't asking um, task related questions in meetings unless it's an uh, unless it's an issue that impacts 
most everyone. Um, the one-on-ones, and, and I think you, what, the way you said it was interesting. I don't get questions until later on. That's not necessarily unusual. So you might want to structure your one-on-ones to be much more relational at the beginning. Uh, again, recreating the trust and openness that you have so that five, 10 minutes into it, they're ready to ask a question. But if you come right on and say, so what, what, what questions do you have or what can I answer for you? They're still not there yet. They need to have the, the time to let this whole um, platform, you know, they need to become comfortable with the, with the moment. So I would structure the one-on-ones from relational to task. And the next issue to address is a question stating, how do you deal with the fact that today there are many ways to communicate? So some people may hide behind something like, I don't read my email as an excuse. Well, if you don't read your email, then you're not going to succeed. True. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how many times I've had that conversation. Um, and one more. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I get, I get a lot of emails. I receive a lot of emails. Um, but I read, I'd like to say I read them um, because there's a tidbit of information in each of them. So if you're not going to read your emails, then how can you expect to know what's going on? And the second, but there's a second, and it's sort of a more important part of that. If you tell me as, my, as a superior, or if I tell my superior, you know, I don't read my emails. Well, you just disrespect, I mean, you just really insulted your leader, your manager. Because as much as I would like to believe, most people don't sit around all day thinking, gee, let's send out one more email. They yeah. send out emails for reasons. And if I'm on, if I say I don't read my emails, then you know, like I said, I've insulted you, um, and your time and the energy you put into constructing the email. Um, I have a, a joke. I have a very good friend who manages to write the entire email in the subject line. So when you open up the email, it's blank. Um, but that's a really effective use of email because. It's succinct. I know exactly what they're saying. Um, so that may be another strategy. Put it in the subject line rather than just like, you know, Wednesday's update. Put the question there. Um, so that's another way to use email to, to your benefit. Yeah, that's creative. <laughs> yeah. This question is about the, the differences between the communication between office or white collar jobs um, and more of the line worker factory jobs. So the question states, these guidelines have been helpful for people who have office white collar jobs, but there's a large part of the workforce who still has to come into the factory or office and do not have the ability to work from home. What can a manager do to reduce the tensions and the us versus them that those two groups have against each other today? Well, that is a, that's a great question. Um, the study I talked about at the very beginning um, of this presentation, uh, where we had over 800 employees, uh, uh, respondents, um, most of them were line workers. Most of them were factory workers. Um, and they don't have access during the day that a white collar worker does. So there's a lot heavier burden on the managers to, to get the information out there. Um, and um, it's, it's, not, it's not easy, but my guess, you know, we did learn that most of them have smartphones, so you can send them an email when they're off duty um, when they're not working and hopefully they get that information in a timely manner and can do something with it. Um, but there are now ways when people enter a factory, we know that, you know, there are many factories that are um, taking people's temperatures when they go in, or there's some sort of safety protocol that's new. Well, take advantage of that, um, that new way of entering the workplace and use it as a way to disseminate information. You can put up a, a monitor or a screen 
with something, the important things you need to know for the day. Um, and while you're waiting to have your temperature taken, you can you know, pay attention to the screen. So use some of the available technologies and use some of the um, new aspects of the COVID workplace to permit you to disseminate messages in ways you would not have done before. Um, these are things that you may have put up in a poster or may have sent out a, a newsletter. Um, you can also just hand out a piece of paper while they're waiting to get their temperatures taken. So we should, in fact, go backwards in technology. Think of the best way to get information to someone. And you have them right there standing in line. So take advantage of the fact that you have the ability to get to a segment of your workforce that you didn't use to be able to do. Um, I also have spoken to people in many factories, there's now plexiglass between line workers. Um, tape up a piece of paper on the plexiglass. Um, again, it's there so they, that they can read it um, or somehow broadcast it. Um, I wouldn't do it um, you know, over a loudspeaker because people will tune that out. But take advantage, like I said, of either the plexiglass or the standing in line to get information to that, to that segment of the workforce. Um, because they were the ones that said openness and trust is, or, or the lack of openness and trust is the reason that I'm looking for a new job. Mm -hmm. So this question transcends the work environment. I think it, it occurs throughout time. It's a question about titling. The person watching states, I used to work at a company where we did not have designations internally, for example, vice president. We had some designations for clients. The reason behind this is to not let anyone feel that they cannot approach another because of title. Is this something organizations can adopt? Yes, we had to obtain the respect of our colleagues rather than have a title. Wow, that's a really interesting way to structure an organization. Sure. Um, that's sort of fascinating. Um, one of the big things, going back historically, um, the high tech industry was the first industry to really flatten the way the organization was structured from you know, massive hierarchies to three or four levels of management. Um, but no matter what happens, the, the research always says, you know who your boss is. Doesn't matter if you have to call them um, with a title or not a title. Um, if you ever go to Europe, um, every level of the organization has a different title and it's expected that you use that. We're much more casual in the US. Um, so while um, I understand that organizations are trying to minimize levels so they minimize status, there is still somebody in charge. Um, and if there's not, then it's likely the organization's having other issues, not just communication issues. Um, but if the, you have to know who you talk to. Um, one of the very earliest management theorists said, you can only have one boss. Because if you have two bosses, you don't know which job to do first. So even like in a matrix organization, if you're working in a matrix organization, there's gotta be one boss that has 51% of your time and one that has 49. Because you need, again, you need to know, you need to have the clarity. So to go back to your question, um, I think that no matter how the organization structured, you know who's in charge, you know who's giving you a raise at the end of the year, um, you know who's assessing your performance, and that's the person with whom you still have to communicate with all the deference, even though it's outside of the way the company is, is structured. It's a really good question, though. I really like the question. Yeah, he, he gets two virtual bagel or two virtual donuts, yeah, right? Two virtual donuts. <laughs> um, so I have two questions on leading and then a wrap up question on the future. Um, so the first one on leading is from a personal leadership um, perspective. This person listening says, I have an opportunity to recommend that we continue one of our usual activities or end it. That's something a lot of us are faced with right now in this shift in our work life. At least in these times, it will be hard to let it go. But given your presentation, 
Perhaps our stress has increased and our boundaries decreased. How do I give something up personally and to the directors? Well, um, if it is something that is deeply ingrained in the organizational culture, I would, to, my own personal uh, answer would be don't give it up because it's something that is, if you work for X company, it's just what you do. And even with all the stress, that we're going through now. If it's, if it's worked for the culture for a while, it might be worth sticking with. Um, that said, if it's something that you'd wondered about before, if this was working, or it's not that important culturally and we can live without it, then maybe this is the time to make a change. Um, and the other thing the, the, to go along with that, is this is also a time of, of experimentation. So give it a whirl. None of us really knew what we were doing when we, you know, when we walked into this. Um, okay, so maybe this, this old practice isn't gonna work. Maybe there's a new virtual way we can do this. Maybe we can do it less frequently. Um, so I, my, my answer might be also be, this is a time to try something new. So if they really think that it's causing stress and it's not going to hurt the culture of the organization, let, then yes, this is a time to modify. But if it's really going to negatively impact or significantly change the culture of the company, I would say try to figure out a way to work through it. And then I'm going to move to the last question. This is about future state. Um, my colleagues are reporting increased burnout, most commonly linked to increased workloads in this virtual setting. Once the pandemic abates, the virtual donut is consumed and <laughs> people return to work. How do you anticipate permanent job descriptions will be impacted? And what effect might the option to return have on perceptions of equity within the workplace? That's a terrific question. And that's a lot of a crystal ball question. Um, you know, there's a lot of popular press out there that says a lot of people are gonna wanna stay working from home. And that's going to dramatically change the, the office, office life. Because people that we used to rely on being in the office or cubicle or station next to us may choose not to be. Um, and so that's going to add that's going to add some new stress when I can't go to a colleague because they chose to work from home, which is, you know, which is fine and is their decision. But I think companies are really going to have to think about this acclimation time. And that's sort of why I brought it up in the presentation about think about when they told you you were going home and you had 24 hours to figure out what you needed to take home. Um, and think about that in reverse. But this time you have a longer period of time to let them come back. And maybe you have, you know, maybe you come back twice a week, three times a week um, and make it something that's transitional. So it's not the same, um, just dramatic change. Um, and there are, some, there are gonna be people who can't wait to get back to the office. Um, so, um, you know, th there are many companies for whom employees do work remotely and have always worked remotely. Um, so it may be that your company can transition, but if you can't, you know, again, this time we have the, this time we have the time available to re, you know, to get people back into the workplace um, at a reasonable speed, allow them to remember what it means to go to work, what it means to, you know, get dressed appropriately, um, whatever that means in your workplace. But um, my joke is that, you know, the refrigerator is just on the other side of this wall. I need to remember the refrigerator isn't just on the other side of this wall. Um, how am I going to deal with that? Uh, what am I going to do uh, with some of the new things that have become part of my routine? Um, and I may be communicating with children or spouses more than I used to. And how do I slowly bring that back down so that I can get my job done. So I encourage employers to really think about the transition and have it slow 
a slow trajectory back to where you were rather than the sudden one we had that, you know, that put us into this position where, where we are today. Dr. Levine, you've taken a really difficult, broad topic that we all obviously have emotion connected to as well in the business setting. And you gave us some really practical ways to address some issues as well as some insights into what the others that we interact with are thinking. So I think this was just an excellent presentation from you and I'm grateful, even though I wish we had more time, I'm grateful for the time that you gave us to do this. So thank you very much. Of, yeah. And for those of you that are watching, um, the next slide has a few upcoming events, the next few webinars and um, a nod towards the Leadership Institute that Dr. Levine is a part of, where he spends more time than this sharing his insights into specific topics like the one we had today. So thank you for being here. We hope you stay safe and well throughout all these times, and we may see you next week. Take care.